Four years after the disastrous U.S. presidential election of 2016, Americans remain frightened, almost beyond comprehension, of fake news. We're not, it should be noted, frightened about real news that focuses on celebrities, that degrades public political discourse, that makes celebrities of politicians and politicians of celebrities, that lusts after scandal, that reports on crime disproportionately to its commission, that celebrates consumption, that deifies athletes, that stereotypes minorities and immigrants, that excuses the police execution of minorities, that demands equal time for even the most moronic of opinions, and that thrives on competition and controversy. We seem perfectly comfortable with that. But beware of fake news. At its core, fake news is nothing more than propaganda. Some of it, to use Jacques Ellul's taxonomy, is political propaganda some of it sociological, some rational, some irrational, some of it seeks to agitate and incite, some of it to integrate. What all fake news has in common, however, is that it is actually a form of counter-propaganda. It is the conceptual child of the digital information environment and always appears either in apposition or opposition to the corporate establishment owned and corporate establishment operated mass media. The relationship of fake news to propaganda can perhaps be better understood by returning to systems theories, specifically Claude Shannon and Warren Weaver's mathematical theory of communication, also known as information theory. The word information in the context of information theory does not necessarily mean what we might usually think it to mean. A dictionary in this case is an insufficient source for understanding information theory. Webster's Dictionary uh, it defines information as the communication or reception of knowledge or intelligence, knowledge obtained from investigation, study, or instruction, intelligence, news, facts, data. But for the purposes of information theory, these definitions lead us down a dead end. Warren Weaver tells us that the word information in this theory is used in a special sense that must not be confused with its ordinary usage. In particular, information must not be confused with meaning. The word information relates not so much to what you do say as to what you could say. That is, information is a measure of freedom of choice when one selects a message. The less information one has, the less freedom they have to choose among messages, and the higher the probability that any given message will be chosen. The more information one has, the more freedom they exercise choose among messages, and it becomes very difficult to predict what that person will say next. I think it is significant that Weaver not only points out but emphasizes this particular point in Claude Shannon's work. It indicates a qualitative judgment of support for more rather than less information, and an equally supportive attitude toward openness and learning an indication that I hope will be justified later in this paper. Information in information theory, then, does not refer to what you know. Information is what you don't know. If you already know something, that is to say, if you have information about it, then someone telling you about that something is not information. It is redundancy, which we shall examine shortly. For the purposes of information theory, sameness is not information. Difference is. Or, as Gregory Bateson put it, a difference which makes a difference is an idea. It is a bit, a unit of information. By this he meant that even in what appears to be a disordered system, a system that appears to be chaotic and nonsensical, a system that we will soon identify as entropic, if we are open to the possibility of finding meaning where none is readily apparent, we may actually discern a pattern amid the chaos. We need to recognize this relationship of entropy to information and resist the urge to recoil from messages that either don't make sense to us or of which we're certain before the fact to be absolutely false. When one meets the concept of entropy in communication, Weaver says, he has a right to be rather excited, a right to suspect that one has hold of something that may turn out to be basic and important. That information be measured by entropy is, after all, natural when we remember that information, in communication theory, is associated with the amount of freedom of choice we have in constructing messages. Thus, for a communication source, one can say, just as he would also say it of a thermodynamic ensemble,
This situation is highly organized. It is not characterized by a large degree of randomness or choice. That is to say, the information or entropy is low. So having established the foundation for understanding Shannon and Weaver's view of information, let's take a look at their model. Shannon and Weaver's model consists of six constituent parts. An information source, a transmitter, a which is subject to the influence of some noise source, a receiver, and a destination. The entire model operates under the influence of a powerful physical law, the second law of thermodynamics. We refer to this as entropy. The information source selects a desired message out of all the possible messages it contains. Uh, messages are constructed, if you will, from discrete, discrete bits of information. This strongly implies a significant responsibility on the part of the information source for choosing bits of information and not choosing others, and organizing them in such a way that they not only have meaning, but the particular meaning that the information source wants to convey. It also implies a considerable level in, of intelligence necessary in both the choice and construction of messages. Furthermore, we can recognize that the information source is constrained in the construction of messages by the amount of information that he, she, or it has learned. The information source cannot construct comprehensible messages from information it doesn't have. This is not to say that an information source cannot lie or make things up. But every lie and every fantasy must come from some sort of internalized experience and conveyed in such a way as to make it comprehensible at its destination. The transmitter encodes the message into some form, physical and or symbolic, that allows it to be con conveyed through some medium to a receiver. The medium is the technology or conduit through which a message passes from transmitter to receiver. The receiver takes in the signal and uh, the signal received and decodes it to reconstruct a message. And the idea of a destination should be self-explanatory, but merits a bit of discussion. In the case of interpersonal speech conversation, the information source conveys a message to that destination, but is expected that the desti destination will then respond, becoming the information source and conveying his, her, or its own message to the destination, who, remember, only seconds earlier was the information source. However, in the case of mass-mediated communication, the intended destination is always a large group of people. For the purposes of uh, technologically complex mass communication, the largest group possible. In such situations, the mass of people who constitute the intended destination remain the destination at all times. There is never any opportunity for them to change hats and become the information source. Now, the internet and social media have changed this situation, and this change, I believe, has contributed to the growing concern over fake news. Anything that disrupts the efficient flow of messages in a communication event is a form of noise. Noise is one manifestation of a powerful physical force that is present in all systems, whether biological, geological, chemical, or mechanical, and that's entropy. But noise is not a mere syn synonym for entropy. Entropy takes many forms in systems and in, in every communication system. Entropy can be defined as the measure of the degree of disorder in a system. It is a, an acknowledgment that every ordered system requires an amount of energy to maintain stability. Entropy is the natural tendency of all ordered systems to move toward disorder and chaos as the system, as the ener order and chaos, as the energy in the system dissipates. But remember as well that this randomness and chaos provide greater freedom of choice in the selection of messages. At any rate, human beings have felt the legitimate need to construct sets of techniques to counteract the effects of entropy on our communication. We call such techniques collectively redundancy. 
Redundancy is a rule-based part of any system that allows it to be ordered and predictable. Uh, redundancy can be thought of as negative entropy. It is that part of the message which is not determined by the free choice of the sender. Redundancy can take many forms. Repetition, amplification, parallel channel reinforcement, structural redundancy, and others. Entropy and redundancy might be thought of as the yin and yang of human communication, appearing, as do night and day, to be working at cross purposes, but are actually complementary and interdependent parts of the system, each necessary on its own merits in any healthy system of human communication. For without redundancy, it is very difficult for human beings to speak to one another. Without entropy, we have very little to say. So we can now present a sort of syllogism, a set of six axioms or propositions which derive logically from Shannon and Weaver's work, and a seventh that derives logically from the previous six. The entropy correlates positively with ambiguity. Entropy correlates positively with uncertainty. Entropy correlates positively with information. Redundancy correlates positively with clarity. Redundancy correlates positively with certainty. Redundancy correlates negatively with available information. And therefore, we can come to the conclusion, and it is a fair conclusion to come to, that entropy must correlate positively with the learning of new information.